Hi, my name is Shuti, and I've been working on my listening skills. I've been getting quite a few requests to do more videos on amplifier builds. For instance, user Sexy Mr. Rogers says, your headband is stupid. Make another amp video, lazy bones. And Doug Sherbert tells me, you look like an asshole, but your amp videos are actually pretty good. And then there's Secret Lintus who says, I leave your amp videos on for my dog to listen to when I run errands. He loves them. The people have spoken, and thanks to your kind words of encouragement, we're going to talk about this, the Mojo Tone 5E3 Tweed Deluxe Amplifier Kit. Originally released by Fender in 1955, the Tweed Deluxe 5E3 is a 15 watt amp known for both its overdrive and compression. You can definitely coax some nice clean tones out of it, but you're going to have to learn to actively use the volume knob on your guitar and the interactive controls on the amp. The amp utilizes a 5Y3 rectifier tube, two cathode-biased 6V6 power tubes, a 12AX7 phase inverter, and a 12AY7 preamp tube. The phase inverter on the 5E3 is a cathodyne or split-load inverter, which you don't typically see in more modern amplifiers. I have multiple speaker cabinets I like to mix and match with, so I opted to build the 5E3 into a head cabinet. You also have the option of building a combo amp. Either way, nearly everything in this video will apply to your configuration. Overall, I find the sound of the 5E3 to be raunchy and untamed. There's something both classic and primal about the amp that make it very attractive. Today we're going to cover the controls, talk about the build, go over the steps for installing a speaker impedance selector, and listen to some arrangements featuring the 5E3. I'll also give your confidence levels a boost by walking you through the initial chassis testing procedure. Finally, I'll give my thoughts on the 5E3 and who I think would benefit the most from the amp. Speaking of arrangements, here's one with some nice distorted 5E3 magic. The control panel may look simple, but there are a few secrets to be found here. First up, you'll find both a bright and a normal channel. The normal channel is, well, normal. The bright channel has an additional capacitor called a bright cap. This cap prevents the channel from being too dark at lower volumes. At max volume, the channels are basically identical. Uncle Larry over on the gear page says the bright channel is smarter than the normal channel. Oh, Uncle Larry! You nut! There's a volume control for each channel and a tone control which applies to them both. The internet is filled with forum users raving about the interactivity of the 5E3's volume controls. Since I lack basic reading and comprehension skills, I'm going to let smart amplifier man Rob Robinette explain how this works. Both volume controls and the tone control all interact with one another even when only one channel is in use. Changing the volume level of the unused channel will alter the tone and breakup of the channel in use. Both volume controls alter how the tone control functions. When the 5E3's bright channel volume is turned full down, its bright cap is connected directly to ground on one end and connected to the bright end of the tone pot on the other. The bright cap then acts as a high frequency tone cap that bleeds high frequencies to ground. It's not a huge effect, but the brightest setting on the tone control moves to less than max on the tone dial. This only occurs when the normal channel is in use. The bright channel does not suffer from this control quirk. It's another reason, besides the bright cap, the bright channel is brighter than the normal channel. 
The most practical use I've found for the interactivity is when you want to get the deluxe as clean as possible. Plug into the bright channel, turn the normal channel up to around max, and then bring the bright channel up to a little over halfway. Get the tone somewhere over 12 o'clock. Mmm, that's clean. Let's have a listen to what that sounds like. <laughs> You can jumper the bright and normal channels to get different combinations of both bright and normal. The aim here is to fatten up the tone of the 5E3. I tend to use a single channel at a time and don't find jumpering the channels to be all that enticing. You should try it out to see if it's for you. The ground switch is here for the sole purpose of replicating the aesthetics of the control panel on the original 55 tweed units. In the vintage wiring scheme, the switch connects to a 0.047 microfarad cap, which then connects to ground. This is so you can pretend you have a period correct death cap. To be clear, it is not wired like an actual death cap in the vintage wiring scheme. It's just there to make things as true as possible to the original without actually being dangerous. With modern wiring, the switch doesn't bother with the facade and it doesn't connect to anything at all. Whichever wiring scheme you choose, the ground switch serves no purpose and has no impact on your tone. The hole this switch is mounted in, however, can be used for a number of different mods. My plan is to put a three-way negative feedback switch here at some point. This would make the amp a bit more versatile, providing options for more grit and cleaner cleans. When I put this in, I'll be sure to make a video on it. Rob Robinette has a massive list of other 5e3 mods, some of which could leverage this hole in the chassis. I'll link that page in the description. The build is very straightforward and Mojo Tone provides a nice, printed how-to guide complete with pictures. There's also an extra large copy of both the wiring diagram and schematic. There are two ways to wire the Tweed Deluxe power supply, vintage or modern. The large wiring diagram and schematic both show the vintage wiring option. So what's the difference here? Well, sonically, it's nothing. For my build, I chose to use modern wiring. I'm not caught up in having this build be period correct. In fact, I don't really care if any of my builds are period correct. My focus is on getting the circuit right and using high quality components. There are two holes for mounting the board to the chassis. Make sure you add components in a way that allows you to easily access these screw holes. In my build, I opted to solder the 25 microfarad cap above the ceramic resistor to provide better access to the mounting screw. If you have trouble holding the cap in place, you can use a few guitar picks to create tension between the parts while you solder. I have a bunch of different speakers, so I decided to upgrade to the Mojo 768 SP output transformer. The OT has secondaries for four, eight, and 16 ohms. You can choose a single secondary to wire up, or you can wire multiple secondaries to an output selector switch. I wanted to have options, so I installed a Mojo Tone impedance and mains selector to switch between secondaries. In order to install the impedance selector switch, I drilled a hole behind the two speaker jacks. This keeps the wires from the output transformer nice and short, 
It also puts the switch in a place where it won't accidentally be changed. Make sure you put something soft under the chassis while you drill so you don't mark up the face of the amp. You'll also want to use high quality drill bits designed for drilling through metal. I have the impedance selector wired so that the most clockwise position is 16 ohms. The middle position is 8 ohms and the most counterclockwise is 4 ohms. If you opt to place the switch here, you'll need to change how the circuit board is mounted in the chassis. There isn't enough room to mount the board without a slight modification. To do this, first line up the backing board and the eyelet board, making sure the mounting holes are aligned. Now place them in the chassis to get a feel for how they should be mounted. Keeping the two boards sandwiched together, remove them from the chassis noting the orientation. Take just the backing board and place it back into the chassis. Pull it out and flip it on the horizontal axis. Place it back in the chassis. The holes in the backing board and the chassis should still line up, but now the backing board will be slightly closer to the top of the chassis. This will give us the clearance we need for the impedance selector. Next, we'll place the eyelet board on top of the backing board using the same orientation we did when we originally placed it in the chassis. The mounting holes will not line up. Pull the sandwich boards out of the chassis. Still sandwiched together, flip them over and mark the eyelet board using the holes in the backing board. Drill these two holes and now you'll be able to mount the two boards with just enough clearance for the impedance selector. The way that the heaters are wired on this build is called flying heaters. This means that they fly above the tube sockets instead of being tucked in the edge of the chassis and approaching from the side. When you wire the heaters, you want to make sure that the power tubes are wired in phase. This means you connect pin 2 of one power tube to pin 2 of the other. You can make this a little easier by marking each end of one filament wire with a black line. For my speaker, I'm using a Mojotone Anthem 12-inch ceramic speaker. From what I can tell, this speaker is very similar to a Jensen C12Q, but at a lower price point. Full disclosure, I haven't had the opportunity to compare the two, so I can't speak to the more detailed differences between them. You might have noticed this nice wood cabinet I've housed everything in. It's actually made of an old cherry dresser that my dad found listed for free on Craigslist. The title of the listing was Family Heirloom Looking for New Home. After promising the family who was selling it that he would take very good care of it, my dad discarded the cigarette he was smoking into the family's yard starting a small fire. He took the dresser home and then tore it apart. During the process, he sent a photo of the broken down heirloom with the text LOL to the Craigslist family. He then made the pieces into beautiful cherry boards, which were used to create this cabinet. Like this video if I should keep things patched up with my dad. Leave a comment below if we should stay hostile toward one another. Once you get this puppy all assembled, it's time to begin the initial chassis testing procedure. Make sure that you check your solder joints and components to make sure everything is snug and where it belongs. You should also give the chassis a good shake to make sure nothing inside is loose. Be sure to follow the safety guidelines laid out by Mojotone in the guide. There are deadly voltages inside amplifiers you should take proper precautions to minimize risk. The information here will cover a successful testing procedure. If you encounter issues at any point in this process, consult the Mojotone build guide for troubleshooting steps. First, we're going to power the amp up without any tubes installed. Make sure that both the fuse and pilot light are installed. We're going to measure between each lug of the pilot light. We should see around 6.5 volts. Now measure between pins 5 and 9 on each of the preamp tubes, and pins 2 and 7 on the 6V6s. We want to see somewhere around 6.5 volts. Next, let's check the rectifier secondary voltage. This is done by measuring from pin 2 to pin 8 of the rectifier tube socket you should get a reading of around 5.9 volts. Now we're going to check the high voltage secondary. Attach one probe to ground. I like to use an alligator clip for maximum safety. Using the red probe, check the voltage at pin four of the rectifier tube. We should get a reading of around 410 volts. 
Now use the red probe to check pin 6. We should get a similar reading around 410 volts. Now we're going to turn the amp off and install the tubes. You might notice that the 6V6s and 5Y3 are a little tough to insert. Make sure that the guide pin is lined up correctly and use one hand to hold open the tube retainer to make insertion easier. Turn on the amp and wait for 10 seconds. Keep an eye out for smoke or arcing. If you see or smell anything alarming, stay calm and shut the amp down immediately. Assuming that everything looks good, set your multimeter to the highest DC setting available. Now attach the black probe to the chassis. I'll do this the same way I did before with an alligator clip. Using one hand, touch the red probe to pin 8 of the rectifier tube socket. You should get a reading of around 386 volts. This may differ by plus or minus 10%. Leaving our black probe attached via the alligator clip, we're going to move over to the 6V6 tubes and check pin 5 of each power tube. We want to see near zero volts to avoid red plating. Plus or minus 50 millivolts is just fine. It's likely you'll need to adjust the setting on your multimeter to get an accurate reading. Finally, we're going to check each of the measurement points on the wiring diagram to make sure our voltages are within an acceptable range. You may need to lower the settings on your multimeter in order to detect the lower voltages. Nice job, you did it. You really pulled yourself up by your bootstraps and made a go of it. I'd give you a firm handshake if you were here right now. I'm just so darn proud of you. Now, it's time for my final thoughts. I've really been enjoying my time with the 5e3. It packs a lot of the same charm as the Champ, but with more headroom, punch, and character. To me, the amp sounds like a smoke-filled biker bar and it offers up much of the same charm. It's rough around the edges, but after a little bit of time, you're gonna become best buds. The amp definitely gets loud enough to hold your own with a band. For practice and recording, I find that it takes a little too much volume to enter the sweet spot. If you're playing in the confines of your home and you wanna get into distortion territory, I'd recommend getting an attenuator. The amp doesn't offer the cleanest cleans or the smoothest distortion, but instead strikes a nice balance between the two, which make it a bit of a Swiss army knife. For big old cleans or a creamy smooth distortion, you might want to consider other options. If you're debating between the 5E3 or the 5F1 Champ, I would go with the 5E3. It's not too much more complicated and it offers up more versatility. Just make sure you have an attenuator if you want to play at bedroom levels. I give the Mojo Tone 5E3 Tweed Deluxe Kit a good out of 10. 